Hi, everyone. My name is Amber Roberts. I'm a machine learning engineer here at Arise. Uh, for the workshop today, we're going to be focusing on a fraud use case. So again, sign up for your free account and follow along if you haven't done so already. Uh, you can go to the link here um, or, you know, you've been prompted to it a few different ways. But as long as you get into uh, Arise.com, um, get signed up, it's a very easy process. You just put in your name, your email, um, and then a confirmation link goes to your email, and then you get kind of signed up right away. So a key thing to note, like, so when you sign up for the platform, you don't just have it for this workshop, this walkthrough, you're able to access it afterwards uh, on your own time. And then you can troubleshoot, perform root cause analysis using all the features available in the Arise platform on your own time. So you can set up monitors around data quality, drift performance, not just on the test examples that we have in the account, which we'll, we'll be walking through today, but also um, in your own use cases where you can upload the data to the platform. You'll have a few more moments to kind of do that while I go through some backup slides on our use case, just to make sure, you know, if, um, you know, financial use cases or fraud use cases aren't as familiar to you, um, you know, we can kind of go through this. So the scenario for the workshop is that you are a machine learning engineer, um, you're at a bank and your job is to build a model to determine whether or not a customer's card transaction is fraudulent. So you know, it, whether or not you've worked with fraud models, like what might happen if you fail to monitor for fraudulent transactions? Like, for example, what can happen with KPIs? Um, you know, essentially, like what performances might suffer? Again, you don't have to have experience in the financial industry, but if you're either over predicting fraud or you're under predicting fraud, what might happen in that case? Like, I want this to be as interactive as possible. So of course, if if no one gives me an answer, I'll just give you uh, the answers. But if you can think of like a few things for, you know, what what would make that challenging, just put it either in the live chat, um, or I think it's there's like the raise hand option as well. Okay. All right. Yeah, I'll pretty much just give people like 30 seconds to respond. If not, um, I'll kind of just like go through the answers for it. So if you fail to monitor for fraudulent transactions, some of you might have experienced this if your credit card got, you know, flagged as fraud and it either, you know, wasn't fraud, uh, that's an inconvenience, or you may have not got something flagged as fraud and it was fraud, in which case that's still an inconvenience to you, the customer, Banks want to avoid doing that because either way, it's a loss in profits for them. They either have to pay for chargebacks. Um, they might have an overwhelmed contact center. You know, that's, you know, potential client churn, um, you know, potential poor reviews, low ca customer satisfaction. So essentially, you want to be able to balance that line of, you know, you're not making, um, you know, too many uh, interactions flagged as fraud, but you definitely don't want to miss the interactions that are fraud. So what might be some metrics uh, for success that you would use to monitor for these fraudulent transactions? And there's not really a wrong answer to this. Normally, there's several different methods that people are using at once, like to kind of monitor for different methods of fraud. Okay. Just checking here. All right. So yeah, for example, like things like maybe you're looking at performance metrics around accuracy, precision, recall, F1 score, true positives, false positives. But for the sake of the workshop today, we're going to be focused around a false negative rate. This is also known as the miss rate. So it's the probability that a true positive will be missed by the test. So example, like the higher your false negative rate, the more fraud is actually slipping through the cracks. And just a few more questions before we get started. I know there are folks here from a variety of different domains, different expertise. There are folks, you know, that are data scientists, that are engineers, that are folks around the product area and just a wide range. Um, so I'm curious, like, has anyone here put models into production um, or knows what might make monitoring a mo model in production challenging? Uh, if they have any of those scenarios, because, um, 
really like what we're getting into the work the workshop today isn't just showing you a troubleshooting workflow it's showing you how much better it is to troubleshoot a problem in performance with the rise than the current methods so i'm just curious like if anyone's done that um, if there's any you know best practices things to look for that you've experienced yourself um you know because that we have what you know is kind of most common for folks that are monitoring models in production like essentially it's the time to value um, eventually these problems in production get surfaced but issues with that lie around like how long it actually takes for that to happen so um, being able to you know find an issue early do a root cause analysis be able to resolve that problem fast is what's really key to monitoring these models in production so if it takes normally you know, days, weeks, even months to diagnose this issue, we're going to show you how to speed up that process and arise and increase the time to value. We do that by monitoring for drift, data quality, um, you know, performance issues, uh, elevating those to you, um, being able to then resolve your, those issues and ultimately improve your model performance. So I'm going to stop sharing here um, and I'm going to actually run through exactly what you're seeing when you're signing up for the platform. Um, if there's any questions before we get started, uh, feel free to ask them there. And yeah, I think I have a few folks um, from Arise helping me out in the audience to make sure your questions both in the community Slack and um, in the room get answered. Okay. So everyone should see my screen fine um, here. Let me just tune into you guys. Okay, perfect. Um, so this is what you see when you first log in to your own Arise platform. Um, you're greeted with kind of the onboarding process. You can even work with a, a pretty amazing product specialist um, and get, you know, own like one-on-one -on -one time when going through this onboarding process. Uh, she's great. So just if you want for now, just finish and explore a rise. You can always go back to this onboarding workflow with this little quick start rocket ship at the bottom. But for now, we're just going to kind of dive in to one example. Again, you know, this is just going to be a single example. We're not going to be able to get through everything or even close to everything today. Um, but really what I want you to be able to understand is, you know, what is Arise? How do you monitor these in, into production and really see how they can be incorporated into your own workflow? So this is the Arise home screen um, where you'll have the models that are seen live, information on the volume of predictions sent, I'm in my own current space. Once I create dashboards, I'd have that information as well. And these are where my monitors around performance drift and data quality will show up as well. Right now I don't have any monitors set up, so I'm gonna set those up with you now. So we're gonna do the fraud use case. So if I click into this use case, um, I'm greeted with the overview tab. So this is gonna have my performance over time, information around drift and data quality, the model schema. So these are your predictions, your actuals. So you may or may not have actuals, um, but if you do have them, we'll take them in. We'll take them in even delayed your features um, around your model and then also metadata. So what we're going to do first is actually set up the monitors for your model. We're going to select, you know, any of the pre-production um, sets. You can also select anything in like the production workflow as well. Um, for the sake of the demo, we're just going to go with um, a training version. We're going to, again, choose the false negative rate um, because we want to be able to, to see like how much fraud is actually getting through and set our monitors around that. Um, I'm just going to choose a 0.35. Like this is obviously something you'd be working on beforehand for your success metrics. And then my positive class is going to be fraud. So next, I'm going to set up these monitors on drift performance and data quality. Um, if I want, I can send these to um, emails. We can also integrate with Slack, PagerDuty, the easiest way to actually reach you and your team. And then I have them set up. And now you can also see the monitors in the overview page. So I'm first going to walk you through um, a troubleshooting process around performance. 
So if I click into my performance monitor, now again, you would get an alert saying, um, you know, one of your monitors is triggered. Uh, we set these monitors up, as you just saw, around drift data quality and performance for every feature of your model, but you also have the full ability to like reconfigure those and change them out as you would like. So if I go into this monitor, I can see that, um, you know, I can see that it triggered for my false negative rate. Um, again, like false negative rate, the higher it is, the worse it's perform performing. So if it's at, if your false negative rate is one, it's letting all fraud cases through. So you want it to be closer to zero. So at this point, this is where a lot of ML monitoring systems stop. Like they stop at kind of giving you the alert. Um, and that's where ML observability comes in because it's going to dive in a lot deeper and actually help you do a root cause analysis and figure out, you know, what is wrong? How can I correct this? Um, how can I resolve this issue? So I'm going to click now into this troubleshoot model performance button. And now I'm in my performance tracing tab. So we already covered the overview tab. We're in performance tracing. We have an information on our performance over time, our false negative rate, and then we're actually breaking down performance at the feature level. So we have a list of feature names as well as tags or metadata. We have these gradient histograms, and these are going to tell you like these individual slices or inputs, um, you know, when your model's performing well, when it's performing poorly. So your model's performing poor at these dark red uh, areas. And then as your performance, you know, gets better, you get to the lighter yellow regions. So it's a quick way to get a bird's eye view of your performance. And then the way we can rank and kind of triage these, um, you know, these features in terms of what we should look at next are terms of feature importance. So these feature importance values come from like shot values, line values, anything related to your feature importance. But what's really key for a rise and what a lot of customers really like using is our performance impact score that we're actually ranking. Mm -hmm. And this is essentially the delta um, that's between the performance of the slices and your global performance overall. So the highest performance impact score is going to be like the worst performing slices compared to the average, and then um, normalized by volume because we want volume taken into account. I want to quickly just pop back in and see if there's questions. Okay, great. Because I can only see the questions when I go back um, into the workshop tab. All right, we look good there. Everyone seems to be following along. So at this point, you know, we clicked into our performance monitor. We saw there's an issue. We can clearly see that there's a spike in false negative rate right around um, kind of like the beginning of the month. So what, maybe what we want to do now is add a comparative environment to really drill down. Because if we break down um, these individual feature components, we can see that a majority of these merchant IDs um, are, are performing decently. They have more of a consistent false negative rate, except when we see this um, you know, we see this uh, merchant ID as scamids. We're seeing that this has almost a 90% false negative rate. So it's letting a lot of fraud through. And it doesn't really line up with like what else we're seeing. So if I want to maybe compare what I'm seeing in production with my training set, I can actually add um, a data set comparison. Um, and right now we're, you know, we're saying we want to set this to be a training version the key thing is that when you're doing these A-B comparisons, they can be between production, training, validation, and then any version of that as well. So you can really A-B test for any types of versions of your model. Um, just some additional things for you to do um, after the workshop. But here we're seeing, you know, this is our if this is our training set, and this is our kind of performance over time. We can even decide to really like hone in on this, um, you know, poor performing segment. And then we're seeing that, you know, we're at a false negative rate of about 62%, which is, you know, basically double of what we're expected with our training. So what's happening here? What's really going wrong? And now I have essentially these bird's eye view mirrored histograms um, of, you know, the most impacted features. 
So if I again go into merchant ID, we're seeing Scamads actually has like a very high volume for data set A and has no data for data set B. Now remember data set B is our training set. So if there's no data in it for data set B, then that means we haven't even seen it in um, our training. Our model doesn't know what to do with this new information. So we are probably going to need to trigger a retraining cycle with this type of error. And we're most likely like seeing drift um, for this. What exactly do I mean by seeing drift? Well, if we click onto this merchant ID, we can have information on data quality as well as percent empties over time. And then we can also look at drift. Uh, we can change, you know, we can change out uh, again, like the set, the time range. Um, but right now we're comparing our baseline or our, you know, training distribution to our current or production distribution. And we're seeing, you know, before, pretty much like before there starts to be a spike in PSI or population stability index, which is one way to measure drift. Before we see that spike, we're seeing that it's actually pretty consistent. Um, our training and production are matching. But then when we start seeing this spike um, in PSI, we're seeing not only a divergence in our distributions, but we're seeing a brand new input not seen in our training. So kind of having a new retraining cycle for that um, established in order to be able to detect these errors. All right, let me go back and check for questions. Uh, we had a question on what's needed to set up monitoring. So I briefly went through like how to set that up. I can also show that, uh, we could show that quickly on um, another use case too, um, cause that was the first thing I did. So those um, tuning into the session, I know the, the women's panel ran a little late. So I'll just reshow how to set up those monitors. So you set those up by kind of going to set up monitor. Again, this could be anything in the production window and it could be anything pre-production. You set that, um, you know, choose whatever version you log into Arise. Uh, we also have a whole host of documentation for how you actually upload this data into your model. Be able to select your default metric, um, your trigger alert, um, you know, your positive class, and then, you know, you can turn on monitoring for drift data quality performance, send those email alerts to Slack email pager duty, finish it up, um, and then your monitors are already set. Um, and then if I go back to my homepage, I now have monitors set for both cases. Now I do want to go back into this fraud use case because things we've covered so far around performance tracing and root cause analysis. So we've seen how to isolate a particular area, a poor performing segment, be able to add comparisons of those different environments, um, being able to use our performance breakdown, um, histograms and performance impact scores to understand um, like what's happening in that area. Now, another thing that I think is like really interesting to do and is really has really at least uncovered for us a lot of um, issues in performance is being able to even look at this in terms of region. So right now, if we're looking at different states, we see like New York, California, Texas, we can choose to um, like exclude these as a cohort or add them as a filter. So maybe we only want to see how California is doing. If we add that, we can now see kind of the, the differences in a particular region. Um, I could do these by hand or I can do them as you just saw um, in the set. I can also choose maybe to apply this to, you know, one set. I, can, I could choose to apply this to both data sets. Um, so right now I see that, you know, if data set A is filtered on California, I'm seeing California generally performs better than the other locations, about 10% better than other locations. And now our, our performance breakdown also reflects that. I know what we were looking at earlier was, you know, trying to just be able to understand, you know, this poor performing area and how it compares to our, um, how it compares to our training set. So I'll just run through that again. So if we, again, change this to our training set, compare it to our performance overall. What we found um, through our discovering process is we found 
that the merchant scammons um, actually had a, you know, had all this volume. So volume, like essentially the amount of data coming in, had all this volume in our production, but not in our training. So it hadn't been seen in our training. So I'm curious, like if we choose to exclude this cohort as a filter, ideally this false negative rate would drop to um, our expected false negative rate if that is part of like the root cause for our problem. And it definitely seems like this is a major issue um, and it hasn't been seen in our training. So if I exclude this cohort as a filter, we see that the false negative rate has indeed dropped. And so that's one area um, that we should focus in our efforts first, being able to retrain this model on a new input. And then we can actually continue to go through and see like poor performing um, areas, you know, like higher perform, you know, higher risk scores are where our model's doing a poor job of predicting fraud on. Um, and kind of just being able to triage where is my model performing well? Where is it performing poorly? What do I have to do to get my model to the performance that I want? And I'm going to go back to, oh, say another question. Okay, um, let's see this question. I meant those pre-configured and available or something is needed when you bring in custom models. Um, so, okay, I think this question, and feel free to follow up. Um, you can also raise your hand. I can bring you in to the chat. Um, but if, so when you set it up that way, here, I'll show you right here. Um, so when you set up your monitoring first, they are automatically configured, um, but then you are free to change up all monitors as you'd like. So if I go into my monitors tab, you know, I can choose now let's do something around like data quality, for example. If you want a brand new um, data quality monitor, you can create that from the monitors. Uh, essentially, you know, statuses, you make a new monitor around drip data quality or performance. You can also change out or delete any of the existing monitors. Like I said, we set up performance drifts and data quality monitors on every single feature of your model. So, you know, some of these models are going to be extremely wide, have hundreds or hundreds of even hundreds of thousands of features. So being able to have those set up automatically is very useful, but you can make them as specified as you'd like. So I can actually edit this monitor, um, you know, select the different versions and the dimensionality, you know, the type of aggregation I'd want to set around data quality. Again, continuing to add filters, like so you can add on particular features, maybe, um, yeah, maybe even like a given, a given state kind of select ones for California, a given evaluation window, metric alert, and then send where that's triggered. So each one of these monitors, you can change out how you like. And what's really great is that Arise supports version control. So if you update your model, you can just resend it to the space. You don't have to reset up your monitors every time you update your model. Uh, that is something that you do not have to do. Um, and we were you know, very... Um, like explicit, like when we wanted that feature for our platform. Let me know if that um, answers your question. If not, happy to kind of go back over that. Um, if you hear growling in the background, that's not my stomach, that's my Sharpay. Okay. Um, I understand when first starting out the setup process, it's a manual process, but when scaling up, is the whole process scriptable? Great question. So First, I'll start with scale, Charlie. So um, the, you know, you can continue to add these um, uh, at scalable levels, also scalable data. So, and what I mean by scalable data is we scale out to, you know, tens of billions of predictions a day. We work with ad tech companies. Um, so being able to handle these monitors for a large amount of scale is really important to us. Um, in terms of the scriptable process, I'm pretty sure you mean like outside of the UI. We do have capabilities releasing where you can, yeah, where you can actually like uh, type it out programmatically um, and, and change it yourself. All right, great. Um, so Amit, I believe you, um, you're the person kind of 
helping me out here. Any other questions or ones that we had kind of before the questions? I know that these things are kind of set for 30 minutes and then I have just additional questions after that. Um, I know we had a few thoughts around um, like explainability. Uh, so I'm going to kind of pop into our explainability next. Um, and then the other thing we normally get questions on is around our, our dashboards. Actually, maybe we should just kind of dive into one of those for now because um, I know some folks in here have used Grafana, are familiar with Grafana. So Grafana dashboards are very similar to the Arise dashboards, but more but they're for you know ML monitoring. Um, so you can either you know create them directly from this dashboards tabs, create a name, use a template, or you can go in to the use case, create the dashboards from here. And what's great about these is they're interactive. Um, think of it like even as um, you know, like a I guess like an interactive dashboard where you can think about version control, you can think about uh, elevating it to various stakeholders. Um, so you can create a, a blank one um, or you know a scored model or ones that compare different models side by side. If I wanted to make a performance dashboard, um, so right now I'm in this fraud model, so I can't change out the model, but you can select any model you want and then create your dashboards. I can also select the various versions of my model, select whatever features I would like. I'm just gonna select all the features, select my positive class, and then generate these dashboards. So again, these are completely configurable. Um, I can go in and edit each one of them. I can also rearrange, add brand new time series distributions and stats plots, um, you know, just being able to like kind of have that flexibility. Uh, you can delete certain graphs, you can, continue to stack or add on for particular graphs. And um, once again, you can look at this at the cohort level. Everything from Arise is really designed to give you that understanding at the, like the feature level, the input level, um, kind of dive in deep to what you're seeing. So if I wanted to maybe create a dashboard around, um, Let's do, let's still do like a particular state. Um, I can still do, you know, these dashboards focused around California. I could do them focused around, maybe I do like, maybe I do like California, like Texas, um, you know, kind of depending on the coast, the regions that maybe you're responsible for. You can name this dashboard, um, you know, like regional dashboard, like for Amber. And then I can use these to help uh, elevate important information to various stakeholders. All right, popping back into questions. Ooh, some new messages. All right, we also have like the networking lounge now open. Um, so we'll be able to continue to like chat, answer your questions. I hope you all really enjoyed this overview, this run through of the platform. Again, uh, you know, we did not get to nearly all the features available in the Rise platform, so I hope you do schedule an onboarding session with me and so I could get the rest of your questions answered.